right then. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming along. Thank you to Andrew for accepting my paper after many months of me bashing around various post-humanist uh, sessions in the EAA. That's kind of where this uh, session, well, this paper is going, but I will try and put games in it around, so don't worry. So, the digital domain, as we're going to call it today, simply put, is a series of binary numbers in a computer-based network. It now dominates almost every aspect of our lives. However, a critical debate about the, its impacts on cultural heritage and archaeology has been lacking in archaeological discourse, as we've already seen in quite a number of papers this morning. Archaeology is uniquely placed to utilize the digital by being able to construct and reconstruct the past to understand how we got here, but often we just use it to simply just replicate an object. So what is the ontological difference between an interaction in an archaeological uh, object in real life and one that's based just entirely in the digital domain? This becomes a question about the meaning of the being of the digital. So can we discern how the virtual existence comes to exist and not just in the use of ones and zeros? So I would analyze this question by presenting Yostemol's four characteristics of the digital and by trying to relate this back to archaeology by posing some theoretical questions to see if we can understand the ontology of the digital. So I'll begin with some uniquely conceptual problems related to the digital. Humans struggle to visualize the nature and scale of the digital realm. It has been mooted that space travel is the best analogy for uh, comparing the digital world but this does not account for the analog technologies being able to replicate some of the tasks that digital technologies can do or the unintended consequences of new technology. As we've uh, seen already, uh, in terms of the nature of the digital, uh, we've had a number of examples where we can subvert the uh, analog realm into the digital domain. For example, particularly in Photoshop, where uh, you can see here I've got this lovely uh, positive feedback loop going with representation and reality. So we have reality, but then Photoshop takes a representation of the reality, but then we use Photoshop, the image that is created out of that, to create a representation which is then used to judge reality itself. So then the reality then tries to copy the Photoshop, and you can see this in many examples in the real world, and there are many ethical issues involved around this. So we have this positive feedback cycle I want to focus on in particular. And Ultimately, this also contradicts Paul Cripps' statement that information that goes into databases is far too perfect and too often a perfect view of the world uh, because the positive feedback cycle here can be used paradoxically to create or even to, well, as opposed to recreating a whole new world because it becomes a uh, false representation of our world. Um, but I unfortunately don't have enough time to deconstruct this statement further. Furthermore, space is an abstract notion of, is an abstract notion of nothingness, but it is also situated within our reality. It is possible to travel through space, but you're still subject to its physical laws. Nonetheless, outer space is so large, and the digital domain can contain so much information that we can compare it to in this respect. An object that can contain infinite representations can be as large as you like, and any size you want, and yet it can contain more num numbers than you can possibly count. Like a dice with a digital display, capable of outputting any number you program into it, while an analog dice limited to the number of sides it has. Similarly, we, str we struggle to count the number of stars in the night sky. However, the digital makes it possible. So should our human limits remain uniquely human? There may be unintended consequences in trying to overcome what is what I consider human deficiencies. Perhaps this is an aspect of cultural heritage we overlook. The monuments we built were done with human limitations, whereas the digital domain is for us limitless. Yeah, limitless. So now play with digital dice. Why not going around? <laughs> Understand it as digital dice. Right. One. <laughs> there we go. So to try and understand this better, this whole concept of digital. I want to propose the model's four uh, characteristics here of multimediality, interactivity, connectivity, and virtuality. However, I want to focus on virtuality, so I'll skim over his other characteristics first to help understand the digital realm. So multimediality is a combination of uh, words, sounds, images, etc., and I'm including here also sensory experiences that have yet to be created into a digital uh, content, into a single binary code, which allows for any digital content to become manipulated, become unstable, decontextualized, and become an easier interface between computers and humans. The binary code supersedes writing as a medium, and some argue this is the defining characteristic of digital, as all digital information is superseded and becomes either ones or zeros, and is the basis of virtuality in its present form, as we can combine senses of a single format. Sketchfab, perfect example we've had earlier, because that's taking everything out of its context, and despite the fact that you say about a lot of the sites that are presented on Sketchfab have no information about their analog context, that time actually kind of doesn't matter because in the digital it becomes its own site because you're manipulating that data into something completely new. So it's effectively a new object. Even though it's a copy of a site in the analog, it actually becomes a completely new original in the digital domain. 
interactivity focuses on the way in which the user navigates through the digital by organizing the data themselves. A book in a digital requires no page number or set structure, unlike my notes here, which require page numbers. These become secondary to the text and superseded by the hypertext. You are free to determine the object of a digital game, even if a goal has been set. Furthermore, many to many broadcasting gives rise to opportunities like crowdsourcing, which is a vital part of many archaeological and cultural heritage projects. Connectivity in this sense is simply defined as how the digital media are connected, primarily through the internet. More than just semantic networks, it has turned out physical social spaces into those for communication networks. Connectivity allows for the concept of positionality, which I'll cover a bit uh, later uh, towards the end of the virtuality characteristic. So these three characteristics <coughs> could be an essay unto themselves. I know I tried to present them a tag last year with great failure, but never mind. However, the final characteristic of virtuality is the most vague of the four of, and merits the most exploration because it also presents the most challenges. Unlike the other characteristics, it is more difficult to make a suitable analogy for virtuality the close comparison to the human mind, where we can make visualizations in our head. But we believe that virtuality is experienced very differently from visions in our mind. It is also a contradiction to say virtual reality, of course, as we probably know, something that is apparent based, uh, placed alongside something that is actually tangible. Yet in computer sciences, reality and virtuality are placed along a spectrum, which is now been refined into this lovely Manson's reality cube model. I've got lots of cubes, don't worry. <laughs> Using the free spectrum mediation, which is the observation of the world from the inside, registration, the ability to navigate the virtual environment, and immersion, where uh, it's how much you perceive yourself to be in the game. I've seen a couple of presentations already which have reflected upon this idea, but have not made the link of this lovely reality cube. So if you want to have a look at that, it has a couple of examples of Google Glass, uh, brain in the jar, uh, consciousness and unconsciousness. So essentially, the reality cube provides this lovely spectrum from uh, reality into virtuality, and it's something I've, I'm going to try and analyze and deconstruct right now. So virtuality implicitly leads into the base of transhumanism. This is defined as a subset of post-humanism which aims to improve the human condition, potentially into an entirely new form of life with this most extreme interpretation. Because transhumanism reflects on ideas of evolution, this touched on questions such as artificial intelligence. However, much of what we consider to be artificial intelligence is at the minute no more than very fast automated fear improving, so it's not really considered to be true of artificial intelligence, but I'll reflect on this in a second. If, you're not, if we are on a unilinear path of post-humanist evolution, then surely it is a question of when, not if. The reality cube model, over there, still in the front row, is taken as an interface between humans and computers which will conclude with a transhuman life form which could take any form of consciousness with virtue and limited intelligence. Sounds straightforward. However, this comes with quite a bit of theoretical baggage. Firstly, this requires a huge leap of faith in technological and human development which has not yet been proven to be technologically determined, if it can at all. Transhumanism is advocated by Hans Moravec and others calls for the use of technology to overcome human limitations and possibly even integrating it together with, a, uh, with human intelligence, for example. In this respect, the archaeological record becomes nothing more than a scientific, superficial, unique linear analysis of how humans went from apes with tools inspired by an external force to overcoming human limitations to become a new form of life, much like a Stanley Kubrick 2001 A Space Odyssey. Sadly, I don't have the rights to show the film, but never mind. <laughs> Secondly, the reality cube exposed the ways in which virtuality could lead to transhuman life forms. A brain in a jar, as advocated by those like Nick Ostrom, is essentially an uploaded consciousness which is very different from the use of Google Glass, for example, uh, even though they are both experiencing virtual reality in the similar ways. So while the reality spectrum can be interpreted as a unilinear model, like early models of societies proposed by early anthropologists, what we're actually experiencing at the minute is uh, the more generally accepted model of multilinear digital evolution. Digital, different virtual strategies are being adopted to respond to the environment and needs of each user. So will any of these methods become universally accepted as the digital singularity predicts? Or is a new model required? If, anyone, if everyone experiences virtual reality with different methods, can they be combined together or remain unique experiments with limited overlap? Moreover, philosophers have struggled to meld virtual and natural realities into a seamless whole, a dichotomy that we may never overcome, with problems ranging from existential and psychological vulnerabilities to compatibility about biological being and intelligence. While Descartes and others have shown us the mind and being are fundamentally distinct, they can be directly contrasted with rationalism, which believes that logic can prove reality existence. Don't worry, I won't talk too much about philosophy. On the surface, then, one could argue that computer science has several links to rationalism, sharing principles in logic and mathematics, especially when the Descartian tradition abhors the use of mathematical proof to prove the soul's existence. However, the Descartian model doesn't disregard mathematics altogether. It just focuses more on how the mind and body are connected. Yet, with its fundamental distinction of mind and body, it contradicts the reality of the human model. Where's it not to? Oh, good, it's going back. So, an artificial intelligence can never have a mind or soul in the same way that we could. Ultimately, Descartes argued against the existence of artificial intelligence, or thinking machines, as he liked to describe them as they can only perform tasks which have, where no intuition is required and not to create anything new, which is also Lovelace's objection if you've heard of it. So for now, we are left with an unclear picture of how humanity and virtuality will evolve, in my preliminary analysis, that is. 
When we interact with artificial intelligence, is it thinking like we do? And I'll leave it at that for you to mull over. No pun intended. So, like I say, philosophy, I'm going to take this quickly. So within virtuality, Demol uses Heidegger's design as his reference point to consider the links between human and technological evolution. In contrast to Descartes' idea of being controlling our perception, design is translated as the human mode of existence in this case. Because man exists, so design is characterized by an openness towards the world. Demol believes that in virtuality there is a specific mode of design with a distinct temporal and spatial mode of being which is phenomenologically inclined. I see I'm starting to run out of time, so I'll quickly summarize this. So essentially our everyday experience of the world is altered in virtuality. For example, in the de-distancing or the decontextualization of distance of our communications when we use virtual applications. In fact, because everything in the virtual is programmable, for, yeah, programmable and decontextualized, we effectively become gods of our worlds, and beings become nothing more than recombined combinable data. However, this also leads to an, a, a paradoxical increase in the unpredictability of unintended effects and intended effects. Uh, as we saw earlier, the uh, artifacts have been uh, Skyrim, for example, as an unintended uh, side effect. So, like I said, quickly move on, because I'm running out of time. So, this is a, uh, something I want to explore more, however, but this is a, uh, another German philosopher uh, called uh, Helmut Plesner, and uh, Moore believes that this is one of the ways forward that uh, digital technology will evolve. And this is something known as polycentric positionality, a subset of virtuality whereby you can operate multiple bodies at once. There's something I briefly mentioned as a description of the connectivity characteristic earlier. I'm going to mention it now. So, Demol uses uh, Pleasant's definition of positionality of the relationship between the living body and its boundary, which argues that our bodies are distinguished from an inanimate nature characterized by a self awareness boundary and the crossing of this boundary. I don't have a pointer, so I'd like to do. Inanimate objects have a closed positionality over there at the Yes, they are. Oh, well. So, closed positionality is the first term with uh, nothing in it. Open positionality is a is the animals which we are un unknown if they do have a self awareness boundary, but they seem to operate as such. And humans have an eccentric positionality where we have a self awareness boundary and we try to break out of it. So, Demol proposes that the next step in this evolution is poly eccentric positionality, which can only be achieved in the virtual because. If you, if you think of yourself in a, uh, in a virtual simulator of some sort, like Google Glass, for example, it's not unthinkable to think of yourself being able to operate multiple bodies at once, potentially within the analog world. Essentially, you could end up operating multiple beings or robots at once on the same side, potentially at different times of day, at different time zones, different spatial areas. So this is something that Demol believes is going to happen. However, okay, so if we quickly summarize uh, between the two, Heidegger and Pleasant now. So, I think that Pleasant's idea is very in a level of solipsism and phenomenology. But who is the more convincing? Pleasant has, has the other hand. Despite the simplicity of being able to change your future trajectory with technology and subsequent agreement with the unilinear uni uni view of evolution put forward by Moravec, Pleasant's eccentric positionality allows for a whole new way of examining human relations and cultural heritage. However, polyocentric positionality is difficult to envisage, and the human body may not be able to create polyocentric positionality. The model is conflating different ideas of Heidegger's life together, unfortunately. So essentially, Whilst design sounds quite convincing with projecting uh, future technologies uh, or projecting your future self with technology, he's conflating uh, Gestell, which is something that uh, uh, Heidegger tried to explore after his decay or his turn of philosophical thought. And Gestell is essentially more technologically suited than uh, design is. Um, I realize I wasn't running out of time. Uh, the other problem is with design as well is the translation issue, which does kind of, I haven't really explored whether it applies to Pleasant, but it seems much more easy to translate what Pleasant's saying that design is, because there's about a million interpretations of uh, design. So, so essentially, polycentric positionality is clearly a consequence unique uh, to the digital domain and presents multiple issues we haven't considered in cultural heritage, while design is more of an overarching ontological framework for digital technology. So how does one experience cultural heritage if you are occupying multiple bodies in multiple time zones? Actually, and to conclude, so in conclusion, does the models Digital characteristics allow us to better understand digital ontology. It fails initially because it appears that Demol contradicts himself. Demol believes that if information technology is the subject of a work of art, then this might lead to a new genre, but with no implications for the nature of the art itself. So Demol thinks a copy of your notebooks into a computer won't fundamentally alter how you see your work. But through multimediality and virtuality, Demol actually notes that our work can become a positive feedback cycle that reinforces a representation of reality, not reality itself, regardless of which sense you use. Ones and zeros may be the rational basis of virtuality, but it creates a false Descartian mirror of representation. But in other ways, he actually succeeds. The virtual world may exist in our reality in one form, but that form is not the same as our reality. Every aspect of something transported into the digital domain becomes decontextualized, 
Transhumanism is considered to go hand in hand with technological evolution. But a multilinear approach to a digital evolution means that we can't necessarily see virtuality as a unilinear path to a digital singularity. Polyocentric positionality has great potential, and I think it's something that can be explored in games. It's um, running out of time, so uh, it's quickly affecting the idea that computers, of course, with so much infinite uh, power, we can potentially try to explore polyocentric positionality practically at some point. Hopefully, I'll get a chance for somebody to fund me and allow me to explore this idea. Um, <clears throat> So I hope I framed many of the same questions we asked about heritage for you in a new light. Uh, a post-humanist critique makes us think of what it is to be human, particularly our limits. Nonetheless, our digital future is still not clear and can go in any number of directions. So I, my thanks go to all those who helped me with this presentation, particularly AOC Archaeology for uh, funding me. And I leave you with these two quotes, uh, which are directly contrasting thoughts of virtuality. Uh, if you know of the Atsuko Short, then good for you. So, Thank you for AOC Archaeology once again for funding this thought experiment and thank you very much for all of you for listening.